A Western proverb states that the truth never changes while a lie must be constantly retold. This statement really makes clear a general principle. During its 80-year history and its 16 national conventions for the party representatives, the CCP even revised its party constitution 16 times. The guiding theories of the CCP started with Marxism-Leninism, Maoism was added, and then Deng's thoughts and recently Zhang's three represents have been added. Marxism-Leninism and Maoism are not at all compatible with Deng's theories and Zhang's ideology. They are actually opposite to them. This hodgepodge of communist theories employed by the CCP is indeed a rarity in human history. The Communist Party's evolving principles have largely contradicted one another. The Communist Party has never had a motherland. Their earliest slogan was World Commonwealth, using communism to unify the world. Today, however, Communist China has become a case of extreme nationalism. The Communist Party originally emphasized social classes, eliminating all private ownership and all exploitative classes. Today, the CCP promotes capitalists to join the party. The present China has the most severe polarization between the rich and the poor in the world. Many CCP members have become filthy rich, while the country has 800 million living in poverty. The CCP even allowed capitalists to join the party and wrote this into the Communist Party Constitution. Yesterday's principles have become reversed in today's politics, with further change expected tomorrow. For example, whether it be collaboration with the KMT, the Nationalist Party, having a pro-US foreign policy, promoting nationalism, or having a cycle of suppression and subsequent rehabilitation, each of these decisions occurred at a moment of crisis. In the history of the CCP, there have been more than a dozen movements that are life and death struggles. In reality, all of these struggles have coincided with the transfer of power following changes of the basic party principles. Every change has come from an inevitable crisis faced by the CCP, threatening its legitimacy and survival. Every goal is for capturing and maintaining power as well as enjoying monopoly over social rights. The CCP promised land to the peasants, factories to the workers, freedom and democracy to the intellectuals, and peace to all. None of these promises has ever been realized. One generation of Chinese died deceived, and another generation continues to be cheated. Societies other than communist regimes, even those suffering under rigid totalitarian rule and dictatorship, often allow some degree of self-organization and self-determination. Ancient Chinese society was, in fact, ruled according to a binary structure. In rural regions, clans were the center of an independent social organization while urban areas were organized around the guild. The top-down government did not extend below the county level. Even the Nazi regime during World War II still allowed rights to private property. Only communist regimes eradicated any form of social organization or elements independent of the party replacing them with highly centralized power structures from the top down. If the former social structures conform to nature, then the communist regime is anti-nature in its essence. Since the inception of the CCP, three basic lines have been established. They are the political line, 
the ideological line, and the organizational line. The entire content of the so-called organizational line is that all CCP members and those ruled by the CCP are to obey party commands unconditionally. In China, most know about the dual personalities of CCP members. In private settings, CCP members are ordinary human beings with feelings of happiness, anger, sorrow, and joy. They possess ordinary human beings' merits and shortcomings. They may be parents, husbands, wives, or friends. But placed above human nature and feelings is the party nature, which always transcends humanity. Thus, the concepts of good and evil, as well as all laws and rules, are arbitrarily manipulated. Murder is not allowed, except for those categorized as enemies by the Communist Party. Respecting one's elders is welcomed, except in the case of parents of those who have been deemed class enemies. All Chinese people are protected by the Constitution, except for Falun Gong members. Benevolence, justice, courtesy, wisdom, and sincerity are all good, but not applicable when the party is not willing or doesn't want to consider these traditional virtues. The Communist Party completely overthrows universal human nature and social standards, and builds itself on principles that oppose human nature and social standards. They completely overthrow the superstructure of the old society. During the Cultural Revolution, it was all too common that fathers and sons tortured each other. Husbands and wives struggled with each other. Mothers and daughters reported on each other. And students and teachers treated each other as enemies. Party nature motivated the conflicts and hatred in these cases. The plot of the Beijing opera, Farewell My Concubine, gives a vivid description of how the Chinese Communist Party warps human nature. What needs to be pointed out is that such absolute obedience to the party nature results from the CCP's prolonged course of indoctrination. This training starts in preschools and kindergartens, where party-sanctioned answers to questions are rewarded. Answers that do not comply with common sense or with a child's human nature are rewarded. Students receive political education when they attend primary school and middle school and all the way to college, and they learn to follow party-sanctioned standard answers. Otherwise, they are not allowed to pass the exams and graduate. Today, the CCP has completely degenerated into a political entity struggling to maintain self-interest. It no longer pursues any of the lofty goals of communism. However, the organizational structure of communism remains, and its demand for unconditional conformity has not changed. A party member must remain consistent with the party line when speaking publicly, no matter how he feels privately. The organizational structure of the CCP is a gigantic pyramid with the central power on top controlling the entire hierarchy. This party, situating itself above humanity and human nature, removes any organizations or persons deemed detrimental or potentially detrimental to its own power, be they ordinary citizens or high-ranking CCP officials. The Chinese traditionally believe in the unity of heaven and human beings. 
Lao Tzu said, Man follows the earth, the earth follows heaven, heaven follows the Tao, and the Tao follows what is natural. Human beings and nature exist within a harmonious relationship in the continuous cosmos. The Communist Party does not believe in God, nor does it even respect physical nature. The notorious saying of the CCP was, Battle with heaven, fight with the earth, struggle with humans, therein lies endless joy. In this context, the so-called elimination of private ownership turned out to be looting and plundering everyone's properties, while the so-called public ownership became the communist oligopoly's ownership. Religious beliefs are forcibly cracked down upon and absolutely prohibited, and in the meantime, humanity and human rights are suppressed and trampled. Religious beliefs were replaced with belief in communism's promise of a harmonious society and its rule by the deified Communist Party. The promise of a harmonious society was entirely fabricated to deceive the people. Communism transformed from a false theory into an evil practice, and the Communist Party that implemented the practice thus became an evil specter that opposes mankind, earth, heaven, nature, and the cosmos. In China, nobody has ever seen fiscal budgets for the CCP's organizations, only fiscal budgets for the state, local governments, and enterprises. But in the people's daily learning, work, family lives, social activities, and almost all information sources, the CCP actually extends everywhere and controls everything. From the central government to the village committees in rural areas, the municipal officials are always ranked lower than the communist cadres. So, municipal governments have to follow instructions from the communist party committees at the same level. The expenses of the party are paid by the administrative units, yet they are not budgeted separately. The organization of the CCP, like a giant evil possessing spirit, attaches to every single unit and cell of the Chinese society, as tightly as a shadow following an object. It penetrates deeply into every capillary and cell of society, with its finest blood-sucking vessels, and thereby controls and manipulates society. For this reason, Chinese farmers live in such poverty and drudgery. They not only have to support their traditional administrative officials, but also as many or even more communist cadres. For this reason, Chinese workers lost their employment in vast numbers. The omnipresent, blood-sucking vessels of the possessing CCP have been extracting funds from their factories for many years. For this reason, Chinese intellectuals find it so difficult to gain intellectual freedom. In addition to their administrators, there are CCP shadows lingering everywhere, doing nothing but monitoring them. In the book Communist Manifesto, The Founding Principles of the Communist Party, Marx proclaimed that, in 1848, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. Over a century later, communism is more than a haunting specter. It has possessed a concrete, material body. It spread around the world like an epidemic. 
It killed tens of millions and took away property and the free mind and spirit of hundreds of millions. The CCP, an evil possessing specter supported by force, deception, and the frequent change of its appearance and images, now shows signs of decay, nervous at every slight disturbance. It attempts to survive by accumulating more wealth and tightening control. But these actions only serve to intensify the crisis. It may repeat its intrigues from the past with some sort of retreat. For instance, redressing the Tiananmen Square Massacre, or Falun Gong, or expelling a small number of people as the enemy. Nevertheless, it cannot change its intrinsic evil nature. Facing challenges over the past 100 years, the Chinese nation has responded by importing weapons, reforming its systems, and enacting extreme and violent revolutions. Countless lives have been lost, and most Chinese traditional culture has been abandoned. It appears that the responses have failed. When agitation and anxiety occupied the Chinese mind, an evil specter took the opportunity to enter the scene and eventually controlled this last surviving ancient civilization in the world. In future crises, the Chinese people will inevitably have to choose a game. No matter how the choice is made, every Chinese must understand that any lingering hope in the CCP will only worsen the damage done to the Chinese nation and inject new energy into this evil-possessing specter. We must abandon all illusions, examine ourselves thoroughly without the influence of hatred, greed, or desire. Only then can we rid ourselves of the nightmarish control that the possessing spirit of the CCP has had over the last 50 years. In the name of a free nation, the Chinese civilization can be re-established based on respect for human nature and compassion for all. Shang Hui Zhang Dao